Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. Oh boy! <laughs> Hot dog! It's time for Disney History! Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm, a big, uh, I'm a big video game guy. So, much like his film career, Mickey Mouse has a very long and storied history in video games. In fact, it may be hard to believe, but Nintendo has actually put out more games featuring Mickey Mouse than they have using their own F-Zero or Star Fox characters. Uh, but Mickey has not done a barrel roll, which is kind um, of upsetting. I was gonna say, not yet. That, Do that, a barrel that, roll! <laughs> well, you know, while a new, in, a new generation has been introduced to Mickey Mouse, the video game star from Epic Mickey, released in 2010. Such a good but hard game. Yes. Yes, Very uh... True. Some of us were enjoying a virtual version of him back in 1981, at least those of us still alive, or, or that were alive then. Um, That's be- not me, by the way, folks. I was going to say it. I was going to say <laughs> Before a certain, I love the description, portly plumber even had a name, Mickey Mouse made his video game debut in one of Nintendo's infamous, or infamous, however you like it, handheld game and watch units. And it was simply called Mickey Mouse. And for those of you... <clears throat> Way too young to remember them. The I do remember watch, them. I remember them. You just saw them much later in life. They were vintage when I saw them, but I remember <laughs> they them. They were vintage when you saw them. Um, they, were, they were sort of like the predecessor to the Game Boy and everything like that. Uh, they just had little blinking LCD screens like you would have on those early digital watches. And it was sort of considered a rudimentary form of animation back then. Uh, Mickey was tasked with catching eggs in his very first game. Sounds thrilling, I know. Uh, It was one of those simple get him into position and catch the objects before they fall type games, which was a smash hit. Go figure. Yeah, go figure. It's the easy stuff that counts. (laughs) But uh, Mickey's second appearance was in a 1982 semi-sequel to that, but this one was called wait for it, Mickey and Donald. They were so creative with these game names. Not bad. Um, the same thing, Game & Watch design, but it was it was very similar to how the Nintendo DS system is today um, with the two screens. Donald was on the top screen and Mickey was on the bottom. Uh, in 1983, Mickey made his debut on home consoles in the Atari 2600's Sorcerer's Apprentice. And as you would guess, it's based on the the part of the film Fantasia with Mickey being the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and you controlled Mickey Mouse, and you had to keep the tower from flooding. Well, just a few short years after that, Mickey made the jump to 8-bit gaming on the NES with Mickey's a Mickey Mouse Capade by Capcom. Most of the early NES gamers remember how absolutely frustrating this game was. <clears throat> I do. I certainly yeah, do. I do. Uh, once again, you controlled Mickey as you went through a variety of side-scrolling levels armed with stars to defeat your enemies. And I don't know why they didn't call it Ninja Mickey. I guess that was different. That would have made more sense, but... More sense, yeah. Anyways. Uh, however, Minnie was also tagging along behind you, and you had to constantly monitor her actions because uh, one false move and you'd be done for. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the game was notable for giving cameos to a lot of familiar Disney faces, like characters from The Jungle Book, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, this is one of the very early examples of crossovers between the world. Uh, the different Disney worlds foreshadowed a theme that would show up later in different games. So, Mickey Mousecapade was really successful that it led Capcom to sign a deal with Disney to release quite a few other games based on their properties, and that's how it got classics like Darkwing Duck, Tailspin, and DuckTales, probably the greatest game of all time. Yes, I yes, love yes. that game. I don't, I just, sidebar, my favorite level was fighting that gigantic uh, mouse on the moon. <laughs> love that level. Anyway. I just, I just love using a cane. Yeah, jumping up pogo stick cane? Why yeah. have we not invented that yet? I uh, mean, that's okay, that's yeah. what goes with the hoverboards for me, but we're getting there. Two years. Um, so, Mickey's other forays in the Gaming, they were all of the edgementainment uh, kind. Like Communicore um, Weekly. Like Communicore Weekly, exactly. exactly. You know, he helped his, kid, his days helping kids uh, learn reading and math, and Mickey's Safari in Letterland, which is a very wordy title, and <laughs> Mickey's Adventure in Numberland. There's a lot of lands there. Yes, it's well, that's, that's what, you know, they announced Avatar Land was going away, and we're going to get Mickey's Safari in Letterland. I See, I'd be on board with that idea. That, that might be a lot more fun. Anyways, moving on to the world of 16-bit gaming on the SNES, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, started with the 1992 release of Disney's Magical Quest. Um... 
Mickey was able to switch costumes between a wizard, a firefighter, and a mountaineer to accomplish these tasks. Um, this was the beginning of a trilogy of Magical Quest games on the SNES, which continued with The Great Circus Mystery, which added Minnie Mouse and a second player to the mix, and Disney's Magical Quest 3. They obviously had a hard time with that title. <laughs> and in this one, we get Donald again. Uh, however, the third and final installment was only available in Japan and never made it to the States. It wasn't until two, 2005, when it was made for the Game Boy Advance, that uh, Americans were finally able to complete this game trilogy. The, the Magical Quest games weren't the only ones that Mickey starred in during the SNES game. Uh, he also appeared in a couple other standalone adventure games. The most popular was Mickey Mania, The Timeless Adventures of Mickey Mouse, which was a platformer that celebrated the history of Mickey Mouse's career by sending him through levels that were based on his original cartoons like Steamboat Willie, The Prince and the Pauper, and uh, Moose Hunters, which was an idea they later used again, in a way, mm -hmm. for Epic Mickey for the transition levels. Which was fantastic. Yes, it was. But over on the Sega Genesis, Mickey was making a splash as well. Uh, Castle Illusion was released in 1990, just before a popular Blue Hedgehog made his debut. <clears throat> it was a regular, standard platformer that many people still hold in very high esteem as one of the best ever made, which is saying something. Yep. Yep. It also launched another trilogy for the Sega systems, with World of Illusion coming out a few years later for the, Master, the Sega Master System, and the handheld game Gear, and Legend of Illusion rounding out the series in 1994. Now, even after these incredibly popular games, it seemed like Mickey took a step back after that. He was missing from consoles for a couple of years, and when he did return, he just wasn't in the spotlight. Uh, he was in a couple of generic titles, which you can easily swap out Mickey for any other character, and it would be the same. The first was the Magical Tetris Challenge on Nintendo 64, which, uh... It, it was Tetris, but with a Disney coat of paint. So it was it was really lame, for the most part. And then, yeah, it was very lame. Mickey's Speedway USA came next, which was basically a clone of Diddy Kong Racing. It swapped out the gorillas for... the mouse. And it was terrible. Yeah, and, I mean, it, quietly forgotten. <laughs> if they just could have at least even raced in the Magic Kingdom or something. That would have been I, cool, but. I don't know. I don't know. Not That's this okay. one. Well, the early 90s uh, also saw the trend of taking games that were. Uh, had previously only released in Japan and replacing their main characters with someone else to create a brand new game. Uh, Super Mario Brothers game comes to mind, but that's okay. Um, Mickey wasn't immune to this, and he appeared in the <clears throat> abysmal Mickey Mouse Magic Wands which was nothing more than the popular Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle with the lead role switched, which just really seems abhorrent yeah. to me at this point in time. Yeah. That's just horrible. <laughs> That's okay. Well, his his complete image was redesigned in 2002's Kingdom Hearts. Uh, it was incredibly popular then, and it is now. It's a major franchise, but they made this choice to keep him out of the spotlight, and they only used him a little bit where Donald and Goofy kind of took on the more main roles, and King Mickey was kind of uh, surrounded in, in mystery, and he was embarking on this quest to defeat evil, which, in my opinion, made him kind of a badass, so that was cool. But, there, I mean, there's tons of these games now. Well, finally we arrive at Mickey's latest foray into the gaming world, Epic Mickey. And while a few gamers were disappointed in it, I thought it was really really a refreshing take on this classic character and a great way to introduce his long lost older brother Oswald into the fold. You know, the future looks really bright for Mickey's return to the consoles and Epic Mickey 2, I think, is going to cement that fact later this year. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a geek, he's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's book of the week. The Art of Walt Disney World Resort by Jeff Curdy and Bruce Gordon was released in 2009 and was a theme park exclusive, meaning you had to get it only at the parks or buy it secondhand on Amazon. Um, Jeff and Bruce have worked together on many projects about Disney. We did! <laughs> Jeff Curdy and oh. Bruce Gordon have worked oh, on many projects about Disney. <clears throat> sorry, Jeff. Sorry, Curdy. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> the Art of Walt Disney World Resort is one of the best that they've worked on together. Not only one, it's one of the best books they've collaborated on, but it's one of the best works on Walt Disney World itself. Jeff Curdy is well known and much admired in the Disney community. 
His other book, Since the World Began, which we've talked about on the show, is one of his more treasured books and one of the few that looks at the early history of Walt Disney World. The late Bruce Gordon was an Imagineer and consultant to the Walt Disney Family Museum. He co-authored a few of my other favorite books, like The Nickel Tour, Walt's Time, and Disneyland Now, Then, and Forever. This book is sort of like the sister companion to The Art of Disneyland from 2006. It carries a similar philosophy of presenting um, unheralded artwork. I just love that word. And one of the unique features of this book is in its presentation. You actually have to turn it sideways. All the images are rotated 90 degrees, uh, so they're not broken up. In other words, you have to turn the book sideways, and all the images are presented in the same direction. F- f- funny enough, when I was reading it, I was reading it sideways, and someone was like, you're looking at the book wrong. And I'm like, I'm not. I've, I've got a headache. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So the Art of Walt Disney World Resort is every Disney enthusiast's dream. It's a full-color look at the conceptual drawings, paintings, and artwork that help visualize the Vacation Kingdom. And I really can't stress how amazing and beautiful the artwork actually is. It covers every decade. You're introduced to different artists that lay the foundations for the parks. The visual styles are striking and as varied as the artists themselves. The text that supports the art is just as informative and takes the book past being just a picture book. Uh, you'll learn a thing or two. Go figure. Hmm. The, accom- <laughs> I know. the accompanying descriptions serve not only to educate but also as a mini art appreciation lesson as well. Jeff Curdy is one of the foremost experts on Disney history, and his insight and commentary really add tremendous value to the book. For those uh, theme park archaeologists, this book is a rare treat. A large majority of the art is centered around the pre-opening years and the often maligned 1970s. Fortunately for us, the authors were able to collect many images that were not seen outside of Walt Disney Imagineering and cast member circles. Of course, the cast member circuses were much more fun. I I saw that circus (laughs) at Epcot once, right? Exactly. Oh, let's not talk about that. Too soon? Yeah. Too soon? All right. Too soon. Um, Much of the artwork presents a scale and magnitude that was never put into place at Walt Disney World for whatever reason. Um, You can trace a lot of the transitions from Disneyland to the Magic Kingdom through a lot of this artwork as well. Um, Some of my favorite pieces recount the early days of Fort Wilderness when there was only the Magic Kingdom, Fort Wilderness, and a a growing village. You know, the days when a vacation was more than just squeezing four theme parks into a trip, when you could ride horseback, shop, eat, and spend time vacationing. You know, the images harken back to a simpler time at Walt Disney World. I guess enough proselytizing. This is a superb work that everyone interested in Walt Disney World should own. It does carry a hefty price tag and is a theme park exclusive, so it could be difficult to find on the secondhand market. Uh, so if you can find a copy, grab it. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. Owen Pope. Harness maker. Saddles a specialty. Feed and grain supplies. This window at the Magic Kingdom, it's not located high above your head on Main Street, but rather on the side of the car barn, which is uh, between the fire station and the Emporium. Owen Pope actually ran the pony farm at Disneyland, and he assembled and trained the horses and ponies to handle the stress of working at a crowded theme park. And then, he moved over to Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom to help establish the pony farm there as well. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> so this week's five-legged goat comes from Mickey's house in Toontown in Disneyland. You know, you ever wonder how Mickey keeps his place so spotless? Well, when you're waiting in line to meet the mouse, look around. Keep keep your eyes open. Yeah, you'll run into a specific part where you'll see some uh, mouse and glow for floor wax, some formula 408 and a half, toon dust, liquid soap ivory, which is actually 1348 90, over 93% pure. Wow, messed that up. But that's okay. Mouthful. Mouthful. Comics cleanser and toon de bowl lemon freshener. Which I use. Well, thanks so much for watching, but you know, before you guys go, you know, a great way to support Communicore Weekly is to buy one of our shirts that we've got for sale. And in case you didn't hear on last week's show, anybody that wears a shirt to the uh, Mice Quest event is going to get some special help from us. But, but, you know, where would you want to go if you were going to buy a Communicore Weekly t-shirt? 
Well, now you can actually visit CommunicorWeekly.com. <gasps> I know. Really? We, we have an actual website. It's not done. I'm lazy. It's not finished <laughs> yet. But you know what works? The link to the store to buy t-shirts. And awesome. that's what matters right now. So you can go to CommunicorWeekly.com. The link to the, the store is right there. You can get t-shirts in a whole bunch of different sizes. Buy them from your, for your entire family. Make great Christmas gifts. Not gonna lie. Um, Hanukkah gifts too, mm. Kwanzaa, whatever kind of gifts you want them for holidays, they make good ones. But you can go there and that's and buy where they it. are and buy it. Well, that's pretty. So it only took us thirty-five shows. Only thirty-five shows. I mean, I've I've owned the dot com since before we started recording. It just took me that long to build a website. Oh, okay, okay. Not like you were writing a book with a famous Disney legend and former Imagineer. So. No, no, not no, at all. Not at all. Not but at anyway. All. Feel free to leave us a comment uh, if you're watching on YouTube there or rate us on iTunes. We read them all. We love them. Thank you very much for everyone who has done so so far. We love you guys. But please yep. let us know how much you enjoy the show or you hate the show. Either or, we don't care. We like comments either way. Yes, we do. Um, email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com, especially if you're going to send us bathroom photos. Yes, yes, which we do seem we to get a those. lot of. We love that. We love those. Those are awesome. Yeah. Don't forget, you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly, where we post stuff all week long, and we talk to everybody that's over there, so come on and join us. Yep, and we do polls and other things. You can follow us on Twitter at Imaginerding and at Jeff Heimbuck, because we're a little bit snarkier, I think, on Twitter. I think we're, we're definitely much snarkier on Twitter. Yeah, there's a certain snark amount that's on Twitter, which is okay. Well, anyways, if you've been listening this long or watching, you know I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And we're both from Mice Chat. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly. Puppy. <laughs>